Well, hello there. I'm Ted Gardner, and I'm an interviewer for the Library of Congress Oral History Project that's so beautifully handled here in Cincinnati by our public library. Dennis Daly is our videographer and part of the history department at our public library downtown. And uh, we're having the pleasure and the honor to interview Ed Volkerding, a Cincinnati resident for many years. And uh, uh, Ed, where were you born? I was born, hey, by the Red Ballpark uh, until I was four years of age and they moved out around Castle Farm oh, to yeah. Edgemont near Roselawn. Oh, yeah. Until I went in the Army. Okay. Where, where did you go to? Uh, well, tell us about your family. You have brothers um, and sisters? And I got three sisters and a wife and three children, a daughter and two sons. And so you grew up with three sisters, huh? Yes, sir. Oh, my gosh. What, uh, what elementary school did you go to? I went to St. Charles down Carthage. That was a mile away. We walked both ways. And Roger Bacon and I went to high school. Went to high school at Bacon. Oh, that's great. Uh, uh, growing up in, uh, as a boy, um, uh, what, what did your father do? He was a retired, well, he, did, he was a, a mailman. Oh, mail? Oh, <laughs> Not a walker, a guy that yeah. picked up the mail at the airport and brought it over. And, oh, I see. Okay. Well, that's interesting. I bet, <laughs> I bet he had a lot of experiences, too. Um, were your sisters older than you? or No, I'm the oldest, and uh, I've got four years on one and six, and the uh, Nate on the, okay. the other one, three so sisters. You were big brother to three girls, huh? Oh, yes, oh, yes. Oh, that's nice. That's very, very nice. Uh, did you, uh, a after you left elementary school, then you went to Roger Bacon, right? Yes. Had four years there? Yes. Four. When, when did you get out of high school? 41, 1941. 41, okay. That makes me 85. Yeah, right, yeah. exactly. Um, in, in high school, did you have any particular interests? Did you play sports or have any? Well, yes, I uh, lettered uh, as my senior year of uh, basketball, football, and baseball. And uh, two years I was on the basketball squad. Well, I can so, imagine you were a, a, a big asset with your height. Well, not completely, because in grade school we didn't have a coach. So you had to learn in the backyard or, oh. <laughs> you know, really, we didn't yeah. have a coach. Uh -huh. He'd come around on game day and uh, pick out who he thought would play the game and <laughs> never seen him for another week. Oh, for God's sakes. <laughs> really. Oh, uh, but then when I did grow at school there, they, hey, this guy might develop. So uh, Yeah, right. I, I did well as a rebounder uh, my final year. Oh, I'll bet you did. <laughs> Uh, did you have a good coach? Did you have somebody that you Yes, liked? we did uh, in high school, but uh, yeah. I say in grade school. No, I, I understand. I had no beginning with the... Uh, right. You kind of learned from the seat of your pants, so to speak, huh? There was one school there had a, a crippled man who had him on the floor every night in the week or oh. every day after school. Right. And they, they were very good and sure. um, naturally. Sure, they had the smarts and the coaching. Well, that's good. Now, uh, so 41, you graduated from Bacon, and uh, then what happened in 41? That was still before Pearl Harbor, right? Well, we got out of school, and uh, I found some jobs where I worked, and we were not prepared for that war. Oh, no. So well, there was no reason to bring soldiers in, no, no weapon, no nothing. So we worked for a year, and then 1942, I signed up. They would have drafted me, because then they started having uh, the guns and the rights started making the engines, finally, and they got into production, got boats, uh, a lot of boats. So. Right. I beat the draft by about a month and uh, signed up, and uh, they immediately put you 
behind the desk, see how much smarts you got. Right. If you know, you know, got an education, you you can go somewhere they can teach you. Sure. If you don't have an education, because I recall Fort Thomas was the induction center, and some guys coming in from West Virginia couldn't read or write. Right. And uh, they told them in a general meeting, I said, you'll never be anything but a private. You should have heard the groan. Uh -huh. <laughs> guys that couldn't read or write, 20 years old. Just imagine, I know. Yeah. So that's how it started. Uh, one thing about it, I didn't have a coach. Well, it wasn't too bad. But, uh, an inch or so short, and they kept me at Fort Thomas for a month. And I, every weekend, got a pass, went home, we partied, and finally, they, when the coach did come in, they sent me to St. Petersburg with 90 <laughs> degrees in February. Typical Army. Yeah, that's the way the Army operates. <laughs> now, uh, St. Petersburg, what, what were you doing down there? Was that your basic well, training? That was basic. That's okay. Where you spend, we spend a month uh, learning to march, and that's Good. it, basically. Uh, right. Man, it was hot down there, wasn't it? Yeah, it was about 85 down there in February. Uh, right. Then it did get cold at night, though. Oh. And... Uh, First of all, we got there and went in hotels because they took them over. And that lasted one week. Then they took a, a golf course and erected Tent City out there. Oh. And everybody went out there. No hot water unless you cooked it or boiled it. <laughs> and uh, yes, yeah, so you sleep you in tents in a, a you know, a cot, army cot. Right. Put every bit of clothing in your bag on her. It went down to 20 that couple of nights, and they were worried about the, the orange groves and all that. Yeah. <laughs> 20 degrees, and the, right. you had to get up in the morning and shave in that if you had a lot of whiskers and cold water. Oh, brother. And uh, that's, well, that's where we got our basic. Yeah. Now, you were in basic, what, about uh, two months, three months? One month. Of, one month. Of basic, oh yeah. Wow. So, that was one a... month there, and uh, then a short ride over to Gulfport, Mississippi. Oh, yeah. Where we were in aviation mechanics school then. Okay. And that lasted one month. Uh-huh. What did you learn there? Well, anybody, well, it, it may sound foolish, you know, but even if you're just a gunner in a plane or something, if something goes wrong, uh, having a little knowledge is good. You know, you may push the right thing to keep you in the air or something. Sure. So everybody that was going to be in the Air Corps went through aviation mechanic school. I see. And then they start separating them. I got one more month in at Chanute Field up by Rantoul, Chicago. Yeah, Illinois. One month and an instrument specialist, how the instruments in the plane were. Sure. And uh, then some of them went to propeller school and some of them went to gunnery school. And some of them within two weeks, they learned to shoot, put them on a plane, and a week later you heard they were shot down dead. Oh, I mean, sure. that's how quick this thing went. Uh, yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah, particularly in the early part of the war, uh, as you say, uh, we were ill, ill prepared to get into that war. Oh, let's go back a little bit. Where were you on uh, December the 7th, 1941? Pearl Harbor Day. You remember where you were when you got My the gosh. news? You remember getting the news about Pearl Harbor? I. I've thought often about that. I don't know. I know where I was when Kennedy got shot. And yeah. A few other things, but... I, you must I, have been at home, probably. Well, or working. I for, or working. I, I well, that was know. a Sunday now. That was a Sunday. And I'll bet you were home listening to the radio with your family. I guess. I, I, I just can't, uh, <laughs> okay. can't tell you. I understand. Well, um, okay, so after your month of uh, 
uh, aviation mechanics school, what, what happened then? Well, <clears throat> I was, uh, by then it was the uh, tail end of the summer. I got a 10 days vacation. So I come home 10 days and went back to Rantoul, Chanute Field. I recall it was still warm enough to swim a little. Uh huh. Then on a train, four days, wound up in California. Wow. Funny thing about it, I was deathly sick when I got there because some guy kept coming in, uh, this charge of quarter, CQ as they call it, and I had charged, but I was tired coming from Cincinnati. And he opened the window. There it's getting cold at night. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sleeping. He opened, hey, what is that? So I close it. Debbie didn't open it again. Oh, for God's So sake. by the time of four days on a train doing this to California, when I got out and got in line with my bags, I just collapsed. Oh, my gosh. So that's the way that started. <laughs> but from then, I was assigned to uh, work on airplanes. And I, didn't, I just watched the guys and went with them for one month. Then we were sent to a, a replacement pool where they start forming the squadrons. Mm -hmm. So uh, well, I went to, they started, they sent us all down to Delano, which was on the coast of California and a very little town with two stop and go lights and that's about all, but it had the airfield kind of like Lunkin. Oh, yeah. And barracks to house 250 men. And we were there a month uh, training. And they brought in guys out of the replacement pool, say, here you are, you're the 426th. Uh, what we were trained for, England had such a terrible uh, time. For a month, they slept in their, uh, what's the name down below the run, the railroads? Uh, uh, oh, uh, they couldn't sleep above ground. They were bombed every night. Mm -hmm. They couldn't do nothing about it because at night you can't see the airplanes. So the plane we were trained to fly was a P-61 Black Widow. Hmm. which is in the book over there. Okay. And they had radar up in the nose. So a guy would fly it, the pilot, and man in the back would pick him up on radar. Hmm. So we, they did have a, a stronger set on the ground that would bring the plane closer, you know, within, say, 10 miles of a boogie, uh, they call it. Yeah. The guy in the back, yeah, I got him now. So he'd come in closer and down he'd go. Right, right. And it was made for a, it also had a gun turret. The, the plane we waited for had four cannons underneath mm -hmm. and it had a turret with a gunner. So it had seated a pilot, the gunner, and then the guy in the back. Okay. For some reason they felt they'll take the guns out and take, that meant the gunner wasn't needed. So that seat was open, and remember that, because I'm going to tell you a story. So there was a two-place airplane, a pilot and a guy to pick them up on radar at night. And that uh, they were just starting to come out of Northrop in California. Mm -hmm. And the train on them, though, we went to Delano and had A-20s which is a small B-25, if right. you know airplanes. Twin, twin engine. Twin engine. So that's what we trained on until slow but sure we'd get the real thing. Sure. <laughs> I recall my first <laughs> ride, I wanted to ride in a plane. So I asked a pilot, I said, can I go up with you? And I didn't know that he had had a wreck that afternoon. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and tore down the fence because he, <laughs> the new plane had a, a lock. The lock, the thing like your steering wheel. Yeah. But the A20 didn't. You had to do this to, oh, you had to the boards off. You had to control it all the time. Yeah. Okay. 
So he's in his first flight <laughs> in a P-61, oh. and he's going 100 a mile an hour, ready to do this, and it's locked. And he tore up the fence for oh, half a mile. Oh my gosh, oh. So I didn't know that for some reason. I was he, up, he wasn't injured, huh? Well, wait, I wasn't with him. Oh, okay. But he's, they made him go back up because you lose your nerve. Sure. So I said, can I have a ride with you? I'd never been up. <laughs> said, well, you know, I know so. Well, you know, a funny approach. Eh? Yeah, come on, get a shoot. So at 820, you get in the back and one, two, three steps, and they swing the door up. Yeah. Okay. So we get out a half hour and the door come loose. Oh I'm sitting there, my first ride looking out the ocean. <laughs> really? Oh boy. So, uh, uh, but you survived. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I thought it'd get sucked out or something, but it was okay. And one by one, the planes start coming in and we had one month there to train. Everybody knew what they were doing. Pilots were new and the, the mechanics and the gunners and everybody. And they, they said, well, now I get, you're ready to go. So we had uh, the planes left. Uh, we had one month to train down there. So the, they uh, sent all the planes away. And when they do, then they give you a buzz job. You know go up and come down. That uh, one guy, uh, we had a B-26 there also, and he was a very daring man. He gave us a buzz job, me and the mechanic sitting in the Jeep, and he kind of, boy, look at Scotty coming. And he was about as high as his roof, and I know he was doing 400 mile an hour. Wow. We're sitting in the Jeep and the B-26. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> so, that, that's, then we got rid, rid of the planes then and went, stayed around the base one month. Imagine, no planes, one month just horsing around, Nothing drinking up all the beer in town. And now this is still in California? Yeah, still, still in our area. Then suddenly the train uh, arrived and all our stuff went on cross country to Norfolk. Virginia, oh my yeah. God. Without a, this wasn't a sleeper. This was sitting in the, in the benches and trying Coach, to sleep. Coaches, for, yeah. For four days or so. Oh. so I did go through Cincinnati and called mom, say hello and goodbye. <laughs> but then we were in Norfolk, <laughs> midsummer, hotter. You trade, than, did you trade, I mean, change trains here at, at Union no. Station? Same train. Same here. train all the way? Oh my God, 3,000 miles. So uh, we got to Norfolk and the area we vacated, the 427th, the next squadron, took over where we left. Brought the same planes in and give them a month. So they were a month behind us all the way, I see. even into China. Oh. So uh, we, fooled around Norfolk for a, for a month. But when we did get on the ship, it was the A.E. Anderson, it was brand new, the Hall troops, there were 6,000 guys on there and some wax and nurses and, and we, uh, so we went from Norfolk in midsummer through the canal up to Melbourne, Australia, picked up gas and so forth, and there was winter up there. Mm -hmm. And then over to Bombay, India. And uh, across the Indian Ocean. Yeah, wow. Bombay. And then of course, get off on some, tra their trains. And the thing, the first thing you do, hey, you haven't seen Indians, you know, hi, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> and they come rushing. <laughs> and, Mom, give me a brand new pen. Be sure to write. And here it is in my pocket. You know, hi, Joe. You know, there oh, went boy. the pen. <laughs> and uh, this, the the boat it must have had uh, suction. Well, it had suction pipes, 
I must have had grain in the bottom because I pulled it over and sucked it out. And an awful lot of it went on the ground. Uh -huh. Well, then the ladies come by with a broom and a, a shell, <laughs> dumped it in the bucket, and went, that was going to be their food. Oh, my oh, gosh. Mama, yeah, right. I mean, that's our first impression of, of, of India. India. Wow. Watch them sweep up the food off the ground and guys stealing out of your pockets. So. Oh, my God. Welcome to India. <laughs> oh, golly. So, well, now uh, you had to go all the way across India. Yeah, from Bombay to Calcutta. It's about like San Francisco to New York. Yeah. About the same. So five days on their train. And then it was on wooded slat seats with, boy, five days on that, and you, you, no, no uh, sleep, yeah, uh, no bed, no, you know, none of that. No upholstery or anything. No, just plain old. <laughs> oh, gee. So, uh, welcome to the world. So we were arrived in Calcutta, and they put us up in an area that nobody'd been in for a while, and they had all kind of bugs and snakes and so forth. We had to clean the place out. Wow. And I even just get pictures there of uh -huh. guys sitting on a Johnny with, <laughs> oh boy. Oh, but anyway, I didn't realize you could put a runway down. You could make a runway. They get the little corrugated metal and uh, yeah. get about as big as your living room rug. and. Sure. Uh, Get enough of them and put them, yeah, and hook them together. Yep. Within a few days' time, we made a runway. How about that? Funny thing about it, the airplanes come in, they didn't fly in because they couldn't pick up gas. They came on the uh, ship. So we, as new mechanics, with schooling only and one month out on the line, put together our own airplanes, P-61, and put the wings on and the engines and tails, and we had some good inspectors that inspected everything. Now we had a few dare de daredevil pilots that wanted <laughs> to fly them, and by gosh, up they go. Wow. And when we got them all assembled, well, it took about four planes to haul all our men and equipment, and that's a four-hour ride over the hump. Now, did you have, did you, the, the Air Corps or Air Force, did they give you any preparation for the, the type of land you were in or the kind of weather you were going to experience? No, no. preparation at all? No. Over in uh, India, we were in the monsoons, and it can rain. <laughs> Gosh. Oh my and not God. this little stuff that hits the Oh no, bit. oh terrible. It rained stuff. there. Terrible stuff. Yeah, we, uh, we get in your tent and drop the sides down and this, what are you going to do? <laughs> oh golly, golly. So here you're ready to go over the hump. First time. Tell us about the first time. I got, that was the best ride I ever got to. I didn't, it was C-54, it was cargo 50. Yeah. And it's very nice. Boy, I had a good ride. Uh, it was clear like this. And uh, the Himalayans are 14,000 feet. And the best airplane for being rugged and giving you durability was the old C-47. C-47, sure. Twin engine, very reliable. But it was not... Uh, uh, Oh, when the, when they pump air into them and the car in the carburetors, I forget what they call it. Oh, yeah. It could only go fifteen thousand feet, and that was then it needed more air. Oh, know, I see. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't supercharged. That's the okay. word. Super anything That's supercharged, it. way up high. Yeah. But these weren't, and they had the most of them, and they were very dependable. But they couldn't go high enough. So you had to know where you're going to get in amongst. Well, that's a four-hour ride over mountains. Wow. Well, the, the first place you hit then is Kunming. And you have to go down because you're out of gas. And that was uh, 
good place for the Japanese to follow you in at night. With the runways on, your plane had come in and they'd come in and drop oh, some bombs. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so four airplanes brought us all over pretty well. And eventually they sent three of them up to uh, where the B-29s were and left four of us at Kunming to protect the, you know, whatever. Right. And that's where I stayed for about a month. And uh, Now, were you working on instruments like altimeters and gauges and uh, so forth? Yes, that, that's what... Uh, that, was your, that was your duty, of course. Well, I just wonder, or your rating, I just wondered if you... <clears throat> You had certain things that you had to repair. Ah, uh, go on. <laughs> okay. That was my job. Oh, there, you, sure. There's the control panels and everything. Yeah, Dennis will like to look at this, may, maybe make a copy of it. Um, my golly, you had three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, twenty or so instruments on there that you had. To well, they weren't all. Some of this was the gas and. The, oh, I see. Some of it was radar equipment. And yeah. Some, uh, electronic earphones and. I, I understand. Okay. But you see there's a few instruments on it. Boy, I'll say, it was a complicated situation. Now that was on a C-47 or, or a 54? That was a P-61. Oh, that's, the P that's the fighter plane. Yeah, yeah. that's the one we uh, were over there to knock their planes out at night. Yeah, yeah. How, how effective was that plane in our fighters? Well, we knocked enough of them down that they quit. But then uh, the, the war in the Pacific was heating up so much in our favor that uh, well, why move and gain more ground to pick up some rice patties right. for the Japs? They, exactly. They kind of called it quits, and from then on, we went in after them. Right, right. They were given intruder missions. But everything had to be held down somewhat because... Uh, Chenault, who run that place over there, was like an Eisenhower and, and MacArthur, but he thought that they could win the war coming through over the hump. Over and the they, they, in Washington, they'd, he'd come in for a visit and they'd, come on, get back home. They'd give <laughs> you a meal or two and tell you how great you are and go home. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. uh, you couldn't do it. They used to say, they haul gas to haul gas. Yeah. <coughs> uh, so a B 24s at that time, four engine plane, Liberator. Didn't, didn't bomb so much, they just carried gas. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Drums, 50 right. gallon sure. drums. Aviation fuel and that sort and, of thing. And uh, we, Frank and I, well, a, fr a friend of mine, I, we hit Kunming, we're staying there. They said, well, tonight you'll get a bombing because it's a full moon and it'll show off the airplane wings. Sure enough, in they come about midnight and uh, they had to turn the runway lights on because somebody said, hey, I'm out of gas. Sure. So I turn them on and in behind them come, <clears throat> comes a Jap plane dropping his bombs. Right. <laughs> uh, Frank and I down there, we had gone down there because they give a, a warning or a, a an eight, an eight ball thing that hangs up, uh, you're warned, here they come. Sure, now let's go down and see what the excitement is. <laughs> <laughs> and they dropped a bomb close enough to throw dirt on our head. Hey, let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that was on my 20th birthday. That was like an evening en entertainment, huh? Yeah, for a while. <laughs> so, oh, uh, welcome to China, but... Uh, yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting that what you say about Chenault. Of course, he'd been over there for so long, you know, before, even before Pearl Harbor, 
And of course, he knew Chiang Kai-shek and didn't have much high regard for that guy. So he knew the Chinese pretty well, though, didn't he? She was here and spoke about 10 years ago. Yeah, she was a brilliant woman. I was down there. Uh, yeah, Madam, Madam Chiang Kai-shek. Well, now, so here you, <laughs> here you are watching the show there in, uh, in China. How did you get along with the Chinese people? Have any contact with them? Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, <coughs> Frank and I, after we're there a uh, day or so, let's go to town. Let's see what's in there. So you go to town. And I said, well, where's the bank? We got to get some money. And within a minute, a guy come up next to us and said, hey, Joe, everybody's Joe. They're <laughs> Joe and you're Joe. Yeah. Said, hey, Joe, you want to change the money? Well, yeah, yeah. I give him 10 bucks, he give me 3,000 Chinese dollars. Brand new. Yeah. Uh, boy, so to this day, I'm worried about our inflation for, the, for that reason. Oh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Frank and I, well, <laughs> let, let's buy a pillow top, you know, send it to mom or a girlfriend. And so we go in there and a lady, pretty good sized Chinese woman, most of them look like kids, but uh, as hot as can be in August, I think. And we go in there, oh, it's hot, you know. Oh, it's hot. And she did the same thing. Suddenly she unbuttoned all her, <laughs> no bra, just. Oh, she did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right in the shop. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so we buy this thing and go, uh, well, they recommended a steakhouse. Okay, let's go to steak. Well, now, wait a minute. Did you get your value in money? Okay, what, what, I, I what, think what, that was $100. Oh, that was $100. So I you had so. Okay. Roughly. Right. Yeah. So we go to the steakhouse, and uh, pretty clean. But the women <laughs> were spitting on the floor. I know it's that. But uh, Frank said, let's... Let's get some squeezins, wine. All right, get us a bottle of wine, 100 bucks. And the steak was 300. So, uh, okay, we get through with that. Then the band comes on, and Frank was a piano player, and we both said, that's a song, I, somehow I recognize that. And here we figured out it was in the mood. <laughs> Chinese uh, <laughs> cadence. <laughs> Took about five minutes to figure out in the mood. <laughs> they didn't quite understand that Western music, did they? <laughs> so this will kill you. Oh. We eventually, had, let's. Where's the bathroom? So, well, up the stairs, up one floor, and the trough, you know. <laughs> had a piece of gutter just like you got on your home from here to the wall. About 10 guys could, and uh, eventually I wonder where the hell that goes. I don't see any toilet. Yeah. And I look, the gutter was thrown right out the window. <laughs> oh, gee whiz. I mean, that, that's the way China was. Oh, yeah. Very, so, very, uh, very primitive. <laughs> and on the way, uh, you're housed a mile or so away from the airplanes because the bomb would get everything, you know, get one or the other. But on the way to the airplanes, uh, you'd see at least three people pulling up their pants. <laughs> and that's why they live, no toilet. Just know. alongside the road. Yeah. Well, back in the field. What, what were the roads like? Uh, all dirt. Uh, clay packed down. Uh, yeah. Because you even seen a whole cow hanging on the hook with no glass window to protect it and a truck go by and throw it down. But they say that can be pretty good meat if you <laughs> cook it quickly and everything. Really? Uh -huh. I thought, how in that world? I, possibly we may have been eating them that night up at our mess hall. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonder you survived. <laughs> so, uh, Eventually, then, we got sent up by Chenault. In other words, the 427th was you know, behind us. We were 426th. So they got 
southern China to protect, and we got northern China. Oh, yeah. So we were up there by Chenault. Uh, A1 was for them. A2 was uh, P-51s. A3 was P-47s, and we were P-61s. We had 16 airplanes, and we'd send, let four there, send out three to like Cleveland, three to Dayton or Cincinnati, and three to Lexington, uh -huh. or four, I mean four, four A-12 and four, yeah. and uh, try to protect that area. As I say, they'd, gi they'd give our guys one flight a night. They had four on the base, one go out on intruder. They say, shoot at anything that moves or has a light on it. And so we'd lose a few guys, but pretty well. Uh, so there wasn't much doing there. We were pretty far back. And I, I talked to the lieutenant, I said, get me out of here, I'm bored. So I did get sent to a base pretty close to the action, not walking distance, but airplane distance. Yeah half hour or so. Right. So, uh, <laughs> uh, there were things happened there. We lost a couple guys and uh, I've seen something you never believe. Uh, one day, uh, the, the small planes, they got missions every five minutes somebody was taking off or arriving. But one day, a uh, P-47, that's a fighter plane, yep. single engine, uh, failed after he got up in the air and landed in amidst about 25 Chinese workers. And they killed five of them or so, and they immediately dug a hole and dumped them in. See you later. That's the way they treat them. And it's hard to believe they didn't have equipment. If they wanted to repair a runway, they'd get about 25 workers and they'd sit down and they'd bring them big rocks, carry them, <laughs> and then they'd sit and they'd knock them together till they fit through a loop. And then the guy'd carry them to the next group and they'd smack them till they went through a littler group. <laughs> then they one more hit until they're like marbles. Yeah. And uh, then they'd carry them to the runway. But this is unbelievable. They had a roller about, to about that broad and about that high, and men pulled it. Manual put, labor. Put about 15 guys on a swing and pull a roller all day. Wow. Unbelievable, isn't it? And, uh, well, they had the manpower, didn't they? Yeah, they, I, I've heard that if somebody fell down, uh, run over him. Because right. uh, actually, how would you tell up front, hey, you know, one guy down, until <laughs> uh, till they all found out about it, the roller would kill him. Too late, right. So, uh, well, did you see General Chenault, did you see him in person? Yes, yes, I got to tell you this story. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, while we're at this Ankang, people in that area had goiters. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And I'll say one out of four had a goiter. Oh, uh, my gosh. Some of them had almost a baseball hanging off yeah. their neck. Yeah. And they said it was due to diet, lack of salt. Right. So, uh, i never seen anything like that. Wow, wow. Well, well, Chenault, Major Chenault, Major General Chenault, for those who don't know, was a very, very interesting guy. And he'd been in China with what they call the AVG group, the American Volunteer Group, before we got in the war. So he knew China pretty well. Now, you got any more, another funny story there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> got a million of them, huh? <laughs> uh, now I say the the boss was nice enough to send me up to that other area where a little more something to do. And uh, anyway, we had four airplanes there. 
black. And we'd go down, run them up, and it was okay, uh, at noontime, let's go up and play Pinoch or play softball. Or but anyway, I've seen a fifth black plane coming in at noon. Uh, what's this guy? And uh, before I left Cincinnati, I got to be a pretty good softball pitcher. I was growing and fast pitch softball was just taking hold. Yeah. And I got to be a 6'4", and we were up closer. We were at the distance the girls play now in high school, from here to Walden. So as I say, I got pretty good. But, and the squadron had a, a team, and we'd play, Chino not Chanel, but the other three, Group. off and on, we'd play them once a week. Groups. So anyway, this fifth plane, I wonder what this is. So we come on, park, and what are you doing here? He said, get your shoes and your glove, you're going to pitch. So here, I'm at a base uh, up here, way up here, and he, way back here in Iowa, way. He picks me up in a P-61. Wow. And in that empty seat that they took the gunner out, damn if I didn't sit there flying one hour back to the base. <laughs> pitch a softball game. How about that? And they said, well, hell, the pilots just got paid her a thousand dollars on this game. <laughs> so we win three to two in the field that was never dragged and just airs, you know, bad bounces. So when it's over, Chenault, Chenault's there. But we didn't start the game till we, we seen his Jeep come there with three stars on it. Oh my gosh. He said, hey, I want to bat against you. I don't think you're that hot. The big guy. I said, oh, man, I threw some so easy ones. He said, no, nah, come on, give me your best stuff. And I threw some. Of the, if I hit this guy in the head, he's done. <laughs> the Japs going to knock him out, but if I hit him with a softball, it's all over. <laughs> so uh, we played the game, and then they, he flew me back to where I was. And For gosh sakes. Well, you, so, were, you were special... Special person. <laughs> well, I, I could pitch. And, uh, I did all their pitching against good opposition. Yeah. But well, you had you had the height, and nice long arms, and I bet you could really wind that ball plateward. Well, now, uh, how long were you up there around Kunming? Well, I wasn't at Kunming, I was oh. at Ankang. Oh, I see, okay. Uh, up closer. No, we we weren't out in Kunming. Uh, we have, uh, were at Kunming at first, till the 427th. I got you. So we took the upper half, they took yeah. the lower half. <clears throat> uh, one thing happened when the 427th arrived well, I heard about this. <clears throat> they, uh, the way you'd operate, they had a large radar set on the ground that picked these planes away on out. <clears throat> and then the guy in the back of the airplane, oh yeah, I got him. And they bring him in close. And so anyway, a B-24 loaded with gas was over Kunming, the first stop after the hump. And he said, they sent word, hey, we're under attack, get out to a, a substitute field. And uh, from what I hear, he said, oh, let's stay up here and see the show. Uh -oh. go, you know. And uh, P61 of the 427th, they said, hey, uh, we see the guy, looks like a B-24. They said, there, everything's out of the area. Shoot him down. Oh. So they did shoot down a B-24 loaded with gas. Good guy. My kid said, I got orders to shoot, shoot him down. And so keep that in mind for a minute. That was a 427th. So anyway, uh, the war's over. I'm, I'm still at Ankang and uh, Japanese hit Pearl Harbor. So we're waiting for a ride home now. We're in the middle of China. And uh, 
they got rid of our planes then, so the guys would take off one by one, and they'd give us a buzz job. Yeah. And it wasn't a good one if the tents didn't shake. So 16 planes give you a buzz job. <laughs> so the next day, uh, I guess this, well, we had a P-38 on, on our area, I don't know why. But we were playing a little softball game, and uh, I'm down on one knee catching. And I look out there, and this P-38, you know what that is? Two yeah. engines. Yeah. Twin boom. Twin boom, two engines. Two engines, one pilot. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought, by that gosh. a beautiful plane. Oh, I loved them. Oh, boy. You're hardly here. So way on out there, about four miles from trees, and he had to get up to get over, and they kept coming down. And our center fielder hit the dirt, and our first baseman, and he <laughs> went by about like where that clock is. Wow. And uh, I kind of could wave to him, and he hit the mess hall. Oh, my gosh. Went right on up the roof. Oh, my God. And there's pictures of that in there, too. But the, the burn some Chinaman and the cook that they rolled in the grass. And so he killed himself fooling around with them buzz jobs. Oh, boy. And uh, yeah, that's that. So anyway, there I got flown out with a C-47, the one that couldn't go high because it wasn't uh, Supercharged. Uh, supercharged, all the way out. And on a dreary day like yesterday, mm -hmm. I thought, this is pretty good. I'm on my way home, and this guy can't get above the mountains. He <laughs> has to know where the hell he's going. <laughs> wow. That's a four-hour flight. Why, sure. Where I was going to get back to the coast and took a boat ride home. Now, one more part, if I may. This, so I'm back home and even married and uh, got a letter. They're going to start a reunion group of, of, uh, <coughs> of guys in the, we're over there in China and uh, going to meet in Lima, Ohio. Oh, yeah. And that's a little above Dayton. And be there Saturday. So I said, OK. So I went up there. and. Uh, had a meeting, uh, when, when it's over, I said, any new time, first timers? Hey, I'm a first timer for, who were you with? Uh, the night fighters. And a guy about your size come down the island and decked me. Cause he was on that plane that got shot down, you know? Yeah. He said, I'll teach you, you shot my buddy down. Oh my gosh. So that was it. <laughs> Woo. Really, I wasn't even looking, I was reaching for some or hors d'oeuvres that he unloaded. So, I don't, that's about the end. <laughs> you were lucky. You were lucky. Well, now, <laughs> um, speaking of that area, uh, we heard a lot about Vinegar Joe Stillwell, Brigadier General Stillwell of the Army. Did you ever come near him or anything like that? No, no, he was down in Burma. He was in Burma. Because uh, Japs took the, the <clears throat> road to Mandalay and yeah. that was it. Yeah. So then he started making... He, he, had, he, had, he was flown over the hump into China, but I didn't know if you'd gotten to see him or not. He was such a character, I guess. Yeah, well, I say he was in charge of the yeah, Burma area. Right, right. They had made a new road pretty well ready to open up. Uh, I forget what they called it, but... Uh, the Lido Road? Yeah, Lido Road. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Well, that was just an amazing thing. And, you know, there's there's always been controversy about that. Was that campaign necessary, you know, uh, in hindsight? Which camp? Uh, the, the CBI. Spending all that money and all those men that were lost flying the hump and uh, so forth, fighting in the jungles there. The British, did, did you have any contact with the British Army? Yeah, some of their soldiers, boy, they cussed like a trooper. God, uh -huh. they're, yeah, we just once, uh, 
They they were tough on Indians. I yeah. think they owned India. Yeah, they did. And boy, they were tough on Indian yeah. people. Yeah, they had those uh, those little those little short men Indians who fought in the British Army, and they were that, that was a very interesting type of a campaign there. Well, now okay, so. Here you are, and uh, what was the next move? That you got orders to go home? Well, you, oh no, I, I, I only had three years over there. I didn't have enough points. They sent me out to uh, Sion, HSI Sion, and they had P 47s. I, I don't know, the war is over, but they flew some, and uh, yeah. I was attached, and we played more softball than anything. <laughs> <laughs> now, really, there's a big Texan that could pitch, and we had some real dandies there. I'll bet you did have some really good games. And I'll bet the people were kind of interested in seeing uh, American softball, weren't they? No, i never seen a person. Uh, oh, you never saw them? No. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, where were you when you finally amassed enough points to come home? Up there at Sion. Okay. Which was getting there. Uh, they were ready to start their second fight then, you know, uh, with the communists. Yeah, right. And we'd see some equipment hidden with a covering over to camouflage. Yeah. So they were ready to go again, but uh, I was up close to what they call communist territory then. Uh, right, right. And until I got back out of there and back up over to Hump, over to. Bombay again, you know, all that train, or no, plane ride to Bombay. Oh my God. And out of there and on home to San Francisco. But was it, was it pretty hot at that time of the year? Yeah, until we got home. Uh, I, I got discharged in February. So you came back on a, uh, on a transport, did you, from? Uh, yeah, 30 days, 40 over and 30 back home. Oh my gosh. We went over without an escort. They uh -huh. said, uh, you can outrun a, a sub. Sub, yeah. And they know airplanes operating here. You'll right. be all right. right. <laughs> God bless you. You'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, did you come back through the Suez Canal and then the Mediterranean? Or did you go no. around Africa? You remember that? Or you went the other way. You went. I was in Bombay. We just. You went across the Pacific, didn't you? Come into the San Francisco. Oh, yeah. Halfway but around the world. They had a blonde out there in the boat singing to <clears> us. <throat> she sang, uh, hello, no, it's been so long, whatever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's been so long. Good what to see hell? you or whatever, yeah. yeah. Well, did you get a parade in, uh, in San Francisco? No, just no. get the hell out, get home. Yeah. I got, I got discharged in February. So February. It took from August to February to get me out of there. Boy, I don't blame you, <laughs> I should say. Well, 30 days on a boat. Oh, boring. Play a lot of cards, pinochle, poker. Yeah, yeah. If you, but on a troop ship, as you should, should know, there's only that much room between you and the guy above yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. Had them stacked up there pretty high. Yeah. How how was the chow on the ship? Oh, good. A lot of beans, just like <laughs> the guys say. Hey, the guys are complaining. Is the hell with them? Feed them beans. <laughs> <laughs> oh that was boy. A favorite saying. Yeah. They're complaining. The hell with them. Feed them beans. <laughs> We got about five minutes here, Ed, and, and uh, uh, can you think of any other uh, humorous stories, any bad times or any good times? No, not really. Uh, I was just a kid. Uh, you didn't know what you were doing or why you were doing it, just do it. I know it. What an experience. Be jerked out of Cincinnati, Ohio, and thrust into something like that. Yeah, we didn't know where we were going. We 
Uh, that's part of the reason we all want to send the uh, pillow top. Uh, Souvenir or something, they say, huh? Hey, if they see the tiger on there, they know we're in the east. Uh, they were still censoring mail, too, then, weren't they? Oh, yeah. Your letters had to be very, very plain. Yeah, well, they, well the pilots used to check them out and cut things out. Right, right. Did you funny thing about it, at that time, uh, there was a funny column, uh, Terry and the Pirates. Oh, yes, cartoon. And uh, at that time, they run so, something about uh, uh, Stretch, a big tall kid in there, and he's over in China. <laughs> and I told my folks, hey, read the funny paper, sure. you know where I am. <laughs> really. You didn't ever see the dragon lady, though, did you? No. Uh, <laughs> she was one of the characters in that cartoon strip, the dragon lady. It's funny how small this world is. Uh, after, <clears throat> okay, I'm over, we, we flew, flew the hump, left India, and then arrived at Kunming. And then, of course, they got guys help you load, uh, yeah. get your stuff off. Eh? And the first guy grabbed my bag with a man from high school with me, Roger Bacon. I'll be darned. Really, a, a guy in the same room. How about Hi, that? Ed. Hi. <laughs> Welcome to China. <laughs> so a couple of days later, they put us on detail. And I held the first one I unloaded was Pat O'Brien. Oh. And Jinx Falkenberg. Oh, yeah. Beautiful gal. First one's off. Uh, uh, how about and that? And they put on a show next day. Right. Oh, so, that's great. Uh, that's great. Well, you know, now when you came back, you had, uh, uh, did you have a job waiting for you here? Or? No, boy, no jobs. The last job I had was out of Wrights, and that was on propeller engines. And now we were on jets. Right. So uh, I had no job, had nothing. I, I'll be doing. I wound up painting houses for a while. Uh huh. Uh huh. But you got married, and uh, eventually, yeah, after three, four years, had a wonder, had a wonderful family. Well, by golly, it's just, uh, it's been wonderful to hear your story and your sense of humor and everything. And it's, uh, I know that. Your family and your friends are going to enjoy. You're going to get a DVD of this interview. Oh, really? Yeah. So you know, your your story is history now. You can't hide anything anymore. <laughs> but it's been a real honor, Ed. And we want to thank you for your great service. God bless you, and keep them flying, as we used to say, and uh, keep healthy and well. And uh, I know you're going to have a longer life, and that's that's. <laughs> it's great to be with you, and thanks again for everything.